Welcome to A Moment of Zen. Time to sit back and relax as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sams takes you on a sexy and wild ride covering the latest in film, fashion, pop culture, politics, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective. Here's your host, Zen Sams. Hello, my beautiful friends and loyal listeners. It's always a pleasure to spend my time with you on the airwaves. Thank you for listening and interacting with me on social media. That truly does make it all worthwhile. Please make sure to follow me at Zen Sams. That's Zen with an X, not a Z. Also remember that we're now on TV. Tune in at watch.kpmedia.tv and catch a moment of Zen on the Impact Live channel Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern. All episodes of A Moment of Zen are now available on demand. We have a great show lined up for you today in our influencer segment brought to you by Tempest Network in honor of Women's History Month. We are featuring Hannah Giraldo, daughter of musicians Neil Giraldo and Pat Benatar. We're chatting all about her career, inspired by her trailblazer of a mom, mm-hmm. the E! Entertainment show she just wrapped called Relatively Famous Ranch Rules, and what she has in store for her music career. In our innovation and tech segment, brought to you by Caldwell Soames, we have returning contributor Paul Caldwell, who's chairman and CEO of Caldwell Soames, and today we are chatting with Detroit-bred hip-hop artist and entrepreneur, NPR Richie Rich, who has achieved community success. As an independent artist, Emerging in 2022, he's coming on to chat with Paul about the metaverse, cryptocurrency, and how NFTs are revolutionizing the music industry. In our beauty and buzz segment, I am taking you to Velour Medical in Midtown Manhattan, and we are going on location with advanced cosmetic injector and co-founder of Velour Medical, Sari Katz. She will help me realign my smile in real time with a drop of Botox in my nasal nabial fold. We'll talk with Sari about the many great uses of Botox and all it has to offer. And in our famous culinary and wine segment this week, we are featuring Peter Guimaris, managing partner at Biche Cucina Restaurant Group and a celebrity himself. We are chatting all things tequila as I walk you through its many unique benefits and why this lower calorie option is one of the best liquor choices should you be looking for a low calorie, low carb, low sugar option. Dieters, diabetics, and diehard tequila lovers, stay tuned for one amazing hour. We'll be right back with Hannah Giraldo. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WR, the voice of New York. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Tempus, the next generation of the engagement economy, allowing people to make money on their data and earn cryptocurrency for the time they spend on things they already currently love to do. With Tempus, brands will have the ability to pay you directly for interacting with apps, watching videos, playing games, and more. Tempus, the time is now. Engage and earn. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Our next interview is brought to you by Tempest Network in honor of Women's History Month. We're featuring Hannah Giraldo, daughter of musicians Neil Giraldo and Pat Benatar. Now, as she gets settled into the broadcast room, let's chat women's history. Now, women have always been part of history, but for centuries, our participation in it was overlooked. Early history texts often excluded us altogether, aside from accounts of powerful women like queens. Historians, who were almost entirely men, often saw the past through the lens of the great man theory, which holds that history is largely shaped by male heroes and their struggles. But in 1981, Democratic Rep Barbara Mokilski of Maryland and Republican Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah sponsored a bipartisan bill to declare the week of March 8th National Women's History Week. The week-long celebration took place annually until 1987, when Congress followed the lead of several U.S. states and passed a joint resolution declaring the entire month of March Women's History Month. And today, to kick off this midpoint, is actress, singer, and mega-influencer Hannah Giraldo. With rock music legends as parents, Pat Benatar is one of the defining voices of the 1980s. With songs like Heartbreaker, Shadows of the Night, and We Belong, Pat's music was the soundtrack for an entire generation. 
Their daughter, Hana, is a creative artist and influencer who currently stars in the E! reality show, Relatively Famous Ranch Rules, where she's learning to adapt to life on a Colorado ranch with fellow famous celebrity offsprings like Taylor Hasselhoff, whose dad is obviously David Hasselhoff, and Harry James Thornton, Billy Bob Thornton's son, who's actually still close with his dad's ex, Angelina Jolie. That's a fun fact. Martin Lawrence's daughter is also on the show. Jasmine, Shaquille O'Neal's son, Miles, Ray Parker's son, uh, a Red Redman and Billy Gunn's son, Austin. That's an interesting one. We're going to ask her about Austin. Sounds like a really fun show. Hanna, welcome, Stunner. Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You look gorgeous. So do you. And I absolutely love that you are so committed to work and your craft and to supporting women. It's phenomenal to see how far you've come. Thank you so much. I'm just honored to be on the show. Thank you for having me. I think that this month is really important for us women, you know what I mean? And we all need to start working together. Without a, because... without a doubt. And a big shout out when we talk about women to your awesome PR agent, Barbara Sanchez of Elegant PR, who is also trailblazer and paving the way for women in media. Yes. Barbara, so, thank you. I love you. Let's dive right into this. Congrats, number one, on, on being a woman and your unique womanhood and your strength and how much you've grown in the past few years. A big shout out to your mom, Pat Benatar, for being a trailblazer and paving the way for oh so many women and fellow moms and musicians. Hana, talk to me about what it was like for you and your older sister growing up on tour with rock legend parents and how this shaped you. I think that growing up with rock star parents as, uh, you know, on tour, being a you know kid was definitely different. I wish I had like a better answer for you because I always get asked this question and, you know, everybody's expecting me to be like, oh my God, it was luxurious and it was this, but it was so normal to me that I would just wake up every day and I would have my little crate of toys and they would bring it up to the thing, you know what I mean? And I think that I never really knew my mom was famous until I was about three years old, because I would always like tell my uh, babysitters, I'd be like, do you guys want to play hide and seek? They'd be like, okay, but just don't run on the stage this time, Hannah. And I'd be like, okay, I promise. Like, I'm not going to do it. Every time I would run on the, to the stage just to watch the audience. Do you know what I mean? Cause like, I love, I love being like this, like not the center of attention, but just like on stage, that was always the comfortable spot for me. And I would always try and sing with my mom. And it was just, it was like a really fun experience. I, I wouldn't take it back for anything. You're definitely blessed to have parents who always put you and your sister first. And that's really quite evident. Um, I remember, I think it was in one of your the publications that you were published in. I read that your, your mother really helped shape you. And the t you claimed that the tough skin that you have is from being her daughter. Tell me about that. My mom is a huge role model in my life. She's um, actually the first woman to break through the rock and roll um, boys club, which is huge. Uh, she, I have like a, um, a big love for women who are power empowered. So like Beyonce, people like Beyonce, you know, she's not only an artist, she, she basically can handle the task of a, being a businesswoman, a mother and being just an icon of her own. So like my mother, you know, she taught me so many things. I mean, anytime I need help, she's always the person I call. You know, she really had it really tough. I mean, she still gets asked to this day, what, what's it like being a female, you know, rock and roll artist? And she's like, the same as being a male? Like, what What even question is that? Like, you know what I mean? Like, my mom's like, wait, are you serious? Like, well, what's it like being a friggin' male? That exactly. Exactly. So, so Hannah, you were put to work really quickly. Um, you know, your mom. You were actually designed in your mom's merch when you were a kid, and your mother really was of the advocacy that nothing is going to be handed to you. You have to work for it. Um, we're not just going to, you know, silver spoon feed you here. So, I think that that taught you a lot of values. Um, and of course, being Pat Benatar's daughter, you are going to grow up to be strong. Now, talk to me ab about ranch rules and what it's like to hang out with others of famous parents? You know what? I was expecting actually much worse. I was expecting kids to be much brattier, much more like, oh, where's my butler? Where's my this? I don't know. Just because my parents are so humble and they're so like, yeah, well, you ain't getting anything handed to you on a silver spoon. We didn't have any money. Like, do you expect us to help you like that? No, we got to where we were because we worked. So, you know, being on the ranch and, you know, being around these celebrities was so... Um, refreshing and different. I really was expecting them to be almost bratty in a way, but it felt familiar for me because we all could identify with one thing. And that thing was, we're all living, you know, with famous parents. So we all have this, uh, this, you know, stigma of being, you know, 
handed things on silver platters or that our life is so easy when people don't even realize, you know, it's actually maybe a little harder for us because we have a shadow to live in. No matter what we do, we can't run from the shadow. It's you know true. What I mean? Without a doubt. Because when you talk about uh, nepotism, which, which has been prominent in Hollywood since its conception, while many actors and singers and models um, getting a leg up in the industry due to their successful family members, while many of them are propelled. Um, but within the past few years, the idea of criticizing this is rather uh, more prevalent than accepting it. And it's become more in vogue to really criticize this. And you're probably faced with so much more scrutiny in the casting process um, cause you're really trying to prove yourself above and beyond that. I'm not just here because of a famous mom or dad. Talk to me about what your struggles with being a nepotism baby are and how you're handling it. So I think that, you know, people have a stigma of like, you know, thinking that just because my mom is who my mom is just like a lot of people, you know, like who identified with me on the show, you know, it's not fair. It's not fair in the world that we live in today. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate at Buddha bullying. So I was bullied as a kid. You know what I mean? So I know what it feels like to, to live in the shadow of somebody big because, you know, I was bullied for being freaking my Papanatar's daughter in Hawaii and I hated it. You know, I walked around and I think that today in this social media lifestyle that we live in, it is so scary for these kids because, do you know what I mean? It's not like I'm handed things. It's not like I walk in a room and I'm like, oh, cast it in the new Steven Spielberg movie just because of who I am. Right. I could go through the exact same process as every single person. And if anything, the people are almost looking at me like, why aren't you better? Right. Or you should, you should be getting this role. Like my agent would send me on like the lead roles and I'd be like, dude, like it's an academy. Like you kind of have to like work your way in there. Like maybe we right. should try to navigate a different route, but yeah, people expect that I'm just like, oh, hi, can I get... Well, you know, the, you know? The, the, the good part is, is that you are a hard worker. Your mom and dad have instilled a lot of um, strong work ethics in you. And it's interesting because now that, you know, the sh you're off the show, uh, is there another season coming up? There may be another season. Okay. There may be another season. We'll get to that in a sec, but I know you're focusing on your music. And if there is another season, I know a lot of steamy things went down with you and Austin Gunn and, uh, you know, we'll see where that goes. But are you guys friends outside of the show? Yes, we're friends. Um, you know, you know, it was, you know, can you imagine being in, in, on a ranch, like with no phone and stuck in a yeah. bedroom? Like it was a lot. It was a lot. It was hard, you know? And, you know, it, it was no smoke and mirrors at all. So, yeah, we're friends. We're good. All right. Good, good, good. So talk, t tell me about what you're what you're focusing on now with your music. So right now I'm focused on music. Um, I've been writing music for about two years now for other artists. So um, I wrote a song called Finally by um, Yves and uh, Hugo. I think you've probably heard it. It's like always on like the techno uh, playlist. Yep. Apparently yep. a lot of you heard it. Um, but yeah, I have an EP coming out very soon. It should be out in November. Um, I'm really excited because I've been, you know, I've been doing music my whole life. I actually wrote two of my mom's songs. So, um, you know, it's, it's something that I'm very passionate about and I haven't been really, you know, showing people. So when I come out, I'm just excited for it to all like to just wow people. I'm really excited. I can't wait. I can't wait to hear stuff. Do you want to share, do you want to share any acapella tunes with us? Well, I can't share any of my original songs, but I could like sing a little bit. It is really early, but like, you're a heartbreaker, dream maker, love taker, don't you mess around with me. You're a heartbreaker, dream maker, love taker. If I sing, I used to sing with my mom when she was sick behind the stage. I love <laughs> it. I love the raspy voice you have. Because it's so it, yeah. sexy. It's a you're sexiness to your voice. Dream maker. It's all about mic technique, really, truly. Oh, you're so, incredible. Oh, you're incredible. Are you kidding? Wow. You are. And there goes the doggy barking in the background. Now, um, what is it that you, if you could give advice to, to aspiring musicians or artists, what advice from, from where you're at in your life would you give? Um, just not to, to like take life so seriously. I feel like uh, the world that we lived in is so perfectly imperfect. And that's why, uh, so that's what I try and emulate all the time is, you know, all these people are searching to be somebody else when in reality, you can't change yourself. So if you want to do something, do it, just go for it, go all for it. Don't, don't like hold back. The only person holding you back is yourself. Um, if you want something bad, you got it. Study, 
read books, learn everything you can. Um, you know what I mean? I, I learn a lot from knowledge, like reading. I'm very humble and, you know, I love watching documentaries. So I love if it. you have a dream, go for it. Don't let anybody tell you no, love me or hate me. It's still an obsession. I, I agree. I agree. And I think it's very important to remind all women, especially the gals out there listening, that we need to stick together. And if we stood together the way men do, we can rule the world. And this decade is our time to shine. It's all that about That is women. so true. That is so true. And it makes me sad almost. Because, you know, us women, we already have, you know, it kind of harder in a way because, you know, a male has, you know, like you said, you know, they can't be called the B word, but they could do whatever they want. Whereas women, we need to back each other, like, you know, like support your, your fellow peers and your women guys like sisterhood that's i'm all right. about that so i do it all about sisterhood well hana it was a pleasure having you on the show what an incredible opportunity to get to chat with you can't wait to hear Thank your you having me. can't wait to hear your music guys you definitely have to check her out check her out on the gram at hana geraldo that's with one n and her the show just ended relatively famous rituals but you can access all of the past episodes on demand and it's e-entertainment also a big shout out to barbara sanchez barbara sanchez from elegant pr incredible trailblazer now as we end the show just remember that the 2022 women's history theme pr is providing healing it's promoting hope it's both a tribute to the to the to the ceaseless work of caregivers and frontline workers during this ongoing pandemic and also a recognition of the thousands of ways that women on all cultures have provided both healing and hope throughout history women as healers Harken back to ancient times. Healing is the personal experience of transcending suffering and transforming it to wholeness. The gift of hope spreads light to the lives of others and reflects a belief in the unlimited possibilities of this and future generations. And together, healing and hope are essential fuels for our dreams and our recovery. Just remember that. And next time there's a gal out there that needs your helping hand, you help a sister out. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. Thank you so much, Hana. Amen. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Caldwell Soames Incorporated. Investing globally in transformative businesses like Original Digital Corporation, or ODC, ODC develops advanced consumer and commercial fintech solutions, such as OGPay, which will transform the way you manage your money. From sending and receiving money globally for free, paying for goods and services in person and online, pay bills, buy and sell digital currencies, all while earning interest. OGPay is easy to set up, FDIC insured, and your information is secured. Check out OGPay.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I am your host, Zen Sams. Now coming up in our innovation and tech segment brought to you by Caldwell Soames, we have returning contributor Paul Caldwell, chairman and CEO of Caldwell Soames. And today we are chatting with Detroit-bred hip-hop artist and entrepreneur, NPR Richie Rich, who has achieved community success. Now, Richie just dropped a new single called Live for the Moment, which is now available on Apple Music. And today, Paul is going to help NPR Richie Rich make sense of NFTs and advise him on how these digital assets can be monetized. And as a recording artist, what he needs to keep in mind when dabbling in Web3. Paul will give him insight on how cryptocurrency and all its constituents on the blockchain can help shape a new revenue stream and provide him with direct connectivity to his fans. We're gonna chat metaverse, cryptocurrency, NFTs, and all Richie needs to know to come out winning. Now, as they get settled into the broadcast room, let's chat what NFTs mean to the music industry. According to Chainalysis, which is a cryptocurrency research house, an estimated $41 billion was invested in 2021 to create new NFTs, and that amount is actually likely very understated. That's billions with a capital B, an amount almost as large as the entire world market for art and antiques in 2021, and more than three times the music industry's total in 2021 revenues for streaming CDs, vinyl, and digital and customized radio services combined. The vast majority of those NFTs investments so far have been in digital art rather than music. But since music, like art, can be digitized, 
those eye-popping investments have grabbed the attention of many in the music industry. Depending on who you listen to, NFTs are poised to revolutionize the industry by opening up a new revenue source for musicians that will reduce their reliance on stingy streaming companies, touring, and record label payouts. And here to chat more on this is my expert at hand, Paul Caldwell, and recording artist and social media influencer, NPR Richie Rich. Welcome to the show, superstars. Hey, hey, hey. How's everything? Rich, talk to me. So <laughs> nice to have you on. Welcome back, Paul. Nice to see you again. Talk to me about Trillionaire Thugs. And for those unfamiliar, Trillionaire Thugs is a collection of 7,777 NFTs, each representing a thug in the hype of the hip hop universe. And with more than 300 traits in this 3D collection, it's actually very diversified um, and really interesting. How are you involved in this? Yes, I um got with the Trillionaire Thugs maybe a month or so ago, and uh, we just partnered up, and what we're basically trying to do is create an online within Trillionaire Thugs as well. Um, they're pretty much going crazy with it. Like, they, they're going with a lot of promotions, a lot of marketing. They're putting it everywhere, and we're just pretty much – powering up and connecting the influencers with the art collection with the metaverse and the nft world understood understood so um nfts simply put right an nft serves the same function as a, as a portable flash drive on which files can be stored um, like digital art mp3s video game items documents and other digital goods or links now assuming that any of those stored digital files are rare or unique that flash drive itself could become really valuable does that make sense Yes. Okay. So now I'm going to hand this off to you and and Paul, and you are going to ask our expert at hand whatever it is that you need clarification on, so that this can help monetize your revenue stream in a different capacity. All right. I'll hand it off to you, Richie. All right. One of my first questions was, how does an artist, in your perspective, really make money from a couple? How does an artist really make money um, from- From being a part of a collection. From being a part of a collection. I think that's a, that's a very good um, question. And it's not so different if you think about it in the artist perspective as like a compilation record or a compilation CD. Um, the value of that property, the value of that CD or the value of that uh, record, or in this case, that the, uh, the value of a, of a collection where the artist is a part of that um, needs to be, first of all, it needs to be constructed in a way, architected in a way where there's real value, where you have people, other people on there. All of the artists that are part of that collection um, have uh, value. Uh, to the marketplace. People want to listen to that artist or want to interact with that artist, wouldn't be part of that artist community um, would be the first thing. The second thing is though, um, it's really important to make sure that the smart contracts that are written inside, um, if it's an NFT, when an NFT gets minted, um, I should just back up a second. When an NFT gets minted, um, you can build smart contracts into that NFT that include all of the people that are part of that um, minting process, all of the people that are part of that um, uh, NFT. That could be an artist, include, could include the artist manager, um, could include anybody where the artist may already be cross collateralized with in the music business, it could be publishing. And then every time that NFT sells, that smart contract, the reason it's called a smart contract, is it automatically pays out um, to those individuals, their percentages that are built into the smart contract. And then if that piece sells again in a secondary market or something, um, there's money to be made yet again through the secondary sale of, um, of that piece of, uh, of, of property. In this case, I think we're talking about music. So um, that particular um, song or that particular NFT, maybe, maybe the NFT has two or three songs in it. Maybe the NFT is not a about the 
artist at all, but maybe let's say you were the artist in the NFT and it was your, your, your new single that you just released in the NFT. And let's say that was the backdrop music or that was the background music for that NFT. Um, you would still get paid through that smart contract, but you have to make sure those things are in place correctly because oftentimes um, it's been a little wild, wild west like out there and people get left out or uh, they're not, they don't, not in the smart contract, but their, their IP intellectual property is being used. So I would just say, make sure you have some professionals look at it for you and make sure it's done correctly. Richie, right. does and that now, make sense? Yeah. And now with the smart contract, that's something that would attach it to where, because from my understanding, it was like, if you're a part of the collection, once it sells, then the person who minted it just keeps gaining the 10% or whatever percentage from it. But you're saying with a smart contract, now I would be a part of that as well. So when it sells multiple times, it wouldn't just go to the first minter. That's right. And that, that's, that's, why, that's why I mentioned it that way, because there are multiple ways to do it. If you become an artist, you know, back, back in the old, in the music, old days of music, um, you know, artists were basically employees of labels. Um, they right. actually were employed by labels. They were paid a check, you know, a paycheck. We'll pay you a hundred bucks to make this song. And this song would go make $10 million, you know, <laughs> and, and the right. artists wouldn't, they were paid their hundred bucks. That's it. Um, and then it, and it became more and more mature uh, as, a, as, a, as an industry, of course. But it's still, there's still a bit of that that goes on. And with NFTs, you have to make sure you understand how the payments are made inside the NFT. There are these things called smart contracts. Sometimes in the NFT, whoever's the control, whoever's minting the NFT controls that. They get paid and then they, give, they would give everybody just a, a report basically like old school and um, they would just say hey you sold this much your percentage is this here's your here's your distribution here's your check right um and i haven't seen much cross collateralization coming in where they give bonuses up you know they, they they give advances and stuff or anything like labels uh, do but what i have seen are different types of contracts so it's important to make sure because a smart contract can pay you directly you could simply give them your ethereum wallet and every single time that piece sells, um, you make money in, in, in Ethereum. And essentially, uh, or, or, and, and what you're saying to, to, to back that up is the peanuts that artists receive from streaming services is a topic that has been really well documented for the last few years. But with all of right. this, you know, metaverse uh, malarkey, you know, this, this gives artists complete control, removing middlemen and, and the fine print from the equation, in addition to all these, you know, these recording artists that we see uh, from Grimes, we've seen like the likes of Post Malone and even Steve Aoki make millions in time, uh, money that would have taken them years to make under traditional structures to piggyback off what Paul is saying. And of course, these insane figures are owed to these artists um, that are already established in popularity, but it does pave the way for independent artists like yourself to also make a lot of money and and it's not too similar to the age of self-produced cds who also sought to cut out the middleman and deal straight with record stores and fans right gig tickets exclusive nft um holder only concerts live streamed interviews and limited edition albums are just really a few of the commodities that can be minted but it all circles around the one the one thing, direct access to fans and complete control of the supply chains and rights. Um, and, and that's what really Paul is, is tapping into here. Right. Yeah. No, that all makes sense. And I think, I think also Zen it's, it's for artists, for an independent artist, it's an opportunity to also extend and expand their reach in ways in, in unique and interesting ways that they've really never had before. There have been a lot of corporate controls, for example, game manufacturers, um, people that produce games, game developers. Um, they make a game and maybe they'll have like a, a Galaxy Digital or, or some of these big um, companies that are out there that make, make games. Um, at the end of the day, look, they, they have music in these games. They have all kinds of NFTs. 
are starting to go into these games in that metaverse format. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that if you're a big brand, like a, a shoe manufacturer, let's say a tennis shoe manufacturer, you could put your you could put um, NFT those shoes, put them into the game. And then they could become a commerce engine inside the game and you could go from game to game and, and in the metaverse. Entity. In exactly. the metaverse. In and, the metaverse. But for the artist, the music, it's the same thing. People could choose. Imagine listening listening to background music in a game from um, uh, from NPR Richie Rich's music here. Um, or you just choose another artist and you have the same game, but you have different music. And at the same time, it sure. all gets monetized because it can be fractionalized. Any cryptocurrency that you can mint an NFT in, most of it's Ethereum at this point, but there are more. Algorand is coming around. Um, platforms like OG2D uses Al use Algorand instead uh, as far as minting, but they accept payments in anything, not just uh, uh, not just Ethereum. And there are many, many platforms coming on stream uh, like like that. So, Paul, hold that just, thought. My, hold my, that my thought. advice would be hold that yeah. thought we have we have about 40 seconds left in the segment but i will cut to a commercial break and come back because i know that um richie has some more questions and i'm gonna um add five more minutes on the clock for our friends so just hold that thought we'll be right back you're listening to a moment of zen right here on 710 wor the voice of new york that is npr richie rich along with paul caldwell in our innovation and tech segment a Moment of Zen is brought to you by Caldwell Soames Incorporated. Investing globally in transformative businesses like Original Digital Corporation or ODC, ODC develops advanced consumer and commercial fintech solutions such as OG Pay, which will transform the way you manage your money. From sending and receiving money globally for free, paying for goods and services in person and online, pay bills, buy and sell digital currencies, all while earning interest. OG Pay is easy to set up, FDIC insured, and your information is secured. Check out OGPay.com. Welcome back. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams. This is our innovation and tech segment. We're welcoming back Paul Caldwell, CEO of Caldwell Soames, and our superstar influencer, recording artist, NPR Richie Rich. Welcome back, guys. Welcome, Thanks, welcome. I've, I've had a couple more questions as well about the NFT. Um, one of them was if you make an NFT out of a song, should that song be on all streaming platforms as well? And what's the situation versus it not being there or should it be something that was already dropped? And then which collections would you say you should hold versus sell? What What's the main focus on someone holding something versus selling it in your perspective? Those are great questions. I think I think the first question um, is is really more about um, the 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 format of an NFT itself. So, an NFT, if you have music and you just you just put the music in an NFT, that's one thing. But if you have existing tracks, if you have something you've already dropped, it's not new, <clears throat> um, but you own it and you, you authenticate it. It's yours, um, as far as intellectual property is concerned then um, you have to think about create creatively what goes with it. You know, you, you have a very unique uh, personal look, right? Um, and so that's great because you could advantage that. You could create an NFT. You could have your music. You could pop up on the, on the screen in the video. And you could have some unique aspects to some of your look. Uh, blue eyes, and, but you only mint five NFTs with blue eyes, where you have blue eyes, the rest of it, you know, or where you have a particular gold chain, maybe, or something like that. Um, it's unique. And you do that through uh, just the limiting the number, making it, making it exclusive. So maybe that maybe you minted 5,000, but maybe there are only five where you have blue eyes and a gold chain with big old circular diamonds or something that you have created and so your music is is resident there full stop but the the nft becomes unique because of how you create it so you have to be uh you have to work with creative teams in the nft space to really start to get that done and that's that's what's happened with trillionaire thugs they have um 
they have a lot of traits, like 300 traits, right? I think Zen said yeah. something like that, right? It's those traits that right. matter because it's those traits that you can use on just a few, but you don't use that particular trait on anything else. And that makes those few more exclusive. So exactly. Your, your, your second exactly. question. Yeah, I get that. And okay. now that's, that's mixing the, the music with the art. And that's what's making the music sell as well. That's right. Of course. Yeah, because you can create unique things inside the art because you have a visual. So you have an auditory with the music. You have a visual with the eyes, what the eye sees. That's uniqueness, right? And then where you could do that with music, but maybe you have to create a different uh, lick or, a, you know, something like that or a different transition. But people don't typically hear that because they only hear what they hear. But on visual, right. when you pr create the visual and the auditory, you get this kinet, ki what it's called, uh, kinesthetic response. People feel better about it when they can see it and hear it. That's exactly. What these, that's what's happening in these NFTs. And what's interesting with, with Richie's look is that, you know, you have a very unique hairstyle. You have a very unique, in general, um, uh, vibe about yourself. So you could easily, you know, get paid simply based off of your artistry and your persona. And what we know is that many NFTs are being snapped up, not by fans or supporters of a particular artist only, but by investors and speculators. And many NFTs are being, um, you know, brought to the attention in the overall marketplace in a very unique fashion. Chainalysis found that just 9% of NFT owners held 80% of the market's value. And many of those engage in flipping to turn quick profits. Um, the sandbox at this point is going to be even more crowded in the future due to companies like Adidas that purchased 144 parcels as a platform from which the market, you know, digital and physical wearables are going to be displayed there. And meanwhile, you have Warner Music planning a virtual music theme park where its artists can hang out and mix with fans to be accompanied by a sale by Sandbox of adjacent parcels from music fans. So elsewhere, a virtual real estate developer, you know, you recently put up two and a half million dollars to purchase parcel in Decentraland, which is another virtual world. So you're seeing a theme here. So the metaverse is also playing into this because your NFTs are going to be used to decorate your metaverse. Mm. No, that's dope. That's definitely different in a different way of looking at it. Because I don't think I really thought that deep into it, but hearing you explain it like that, it sounds like it's really something to really get involved with on a deeper level to really understand that part of it. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. And and at this point right now, we are coming into Web3, having consultants and experts like Paul Caldwell at Caldwell Soames, um, who advise many artists uh, on the original to digital corporation on the uh, platform. They minted uh, a series of very unique NFTs for Whitney Houston, Amy Winehouse and Michael Jackson that were all very unique. And going back to what Paul was talking about, they had something very um, there was a theme about them. It was mental health disorder. It was about the last moments in their life and where they all, you know, uh, experienced a decline in mental health. And, and uh, as a result of that, a tragic ending occurred. But now there is a series of NFTs that speaks to those last moments and people can become owners of that. And that is what's unique. It connects fans to concepts, to themes, to, to, to a lot. No, that's definitely some stuff that you don't really think about. And then when you see someone doing it, it's like, wow, it's, it's just so crazy. Because even the thought of NFTs and the way that we think of them, is like we just seen it really take off and become something that's so like wanted now versus what was just happening a couple of years ago is we're seeing the web three and everything's just changing right in front of our eyes. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, we've run out of time, but thank you so much for coming on and asking the brilliant questions that you did because you are speaking to a huge population of, of a lot of curious individuals. Paul, thank you so much for coming on. Always a pleasure. Pleasure, Zen.
Thank check you. out Rich. Thank check uh, definitely check out Rich on the gram at NPR underscore Richie underscore Rich, and check out Paul Caldwell on Twitter at Paul Caldwell. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 W O R, the Voice of New York. That was our innovation and tech segment. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by CCP Digital, bringing you a view from inside blockchain, cryptocurrency, and NFTs. Introducing the latest Blockchain Hero series, Retro Rebellion NFT Collectible Card Packs from the Nifty Company, available January 2022. Find out more online at ccpdigital.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Welcome back to our Beauty Buzz segment. In a few minutes, I'll be undergoing a minor cosmetic procedure with celebrity injector Sari Katz, who is co-founder of Velour Medical, and she's going to be realigning my uneven smile with a drop of Botox. She does this every four months or so as a remedy to my facial pull, where my left nasal nabial nerves were damaged in a 2012 trip and fall freak accident. But the great news is I got Sari in my corner. She's been treating me for over seven years and I trust her implicitly with my face, my smile, and my overall dermatological needs. But before I head over to Velour Medical right here in Midtown Manhattan, let's chat Botox. Now, when most people think of Botox, they envision smooth faces free of wrinkles. While this is certainly one of the most common uses of Botox, it's not the only use. In fact, Botox has many other applications beyond the field of cosmetics and can even be used to effectively treat a variety of medical conditions. Now, this is because the same unique qualities that make it effective against wrinkles also make it effective in other areas of the body. In order to understand the versatility of Botox, we must first understand what Botox is and how it works. Botox stands for botulinum toxin type A, which is produced by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum. Also, this toxin is the same toxin responsible for a type of food poisoning known as botulism. In small amounts, though, it can be beneficial to treat certain conditions. Now, this is because Botox is a neurotoxin, meaning that it can temporarily paralyze the muscles by blocking the receptors at the neuromuscular junction or places where the nerves communicate with the muscles. Now, when used cosmetically, Botox paralyzes the facial muscles that cause wrinkles, which reduce the appearance of wrinkles. Now, since Botox interrupts the neuromuscular junction to paralyze muscles, it's beneficial for the treatment of medical conditions. Now, in my case, I have muscle spasms. This is why it can be used to treat a variety of medical conditions such as blepharospasms, which is a movement disorder to the eyelids, characterized by eyelid spasms and droopy eyelids. Bruxism, also known as teeth grinding or clenching. Dystonia is a movement disorder that causes uncontrollable muscle contractions in one muscle or a muscle group or even the entire body. Drooling occurs when the salivary glands are producing an excessive amount of saliva. Spasticity, which is a neurological condition that causes the muscles to tighten or stiffen, restricting natural movement. Spasmodic dysphonia is a neurological condition that makes the vocal cords sound shaky, hoarse, or even strained. Now, Botox has many uses, my dear friends. It's not just the potion to youth. Stay tuned as I head down to Velour Medical to get my Botox on with Sari Katz. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Revere Securities. Revere is committed to building a relationship of trust in which they work closely with you to help you define your objectives, explore alternatives, and choose the financial and investment strategies that are most appropriate for you. Go to reveresecurities.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WR, the voice of New York. We're right here at Velour Medical with the famous celebrity injector, Sari Katz, and one of my besties. And she is going to start working on my face and I will walk you through what I need to go through every three or four months to make sure that my, my smile stays as even as possible. And I'm in the patient chair and she is just drying up some of the magic stuff to make my face look fabulous and what I'm doing today is evening out my smile um, as a result of facial trauma back in 2012. Sari has been treating me and she drops a little bit of Botox in my 
left nasal nabial fold and as a result it relaxes the muscle and I don't speak with a pull uh, and then further we have to even out my lips because of course with a little bit of Botox and down muscle time comes the need to uplift some of the areas that you relax and so she's going to be puffing out my lips and of course any excuse that I can get to get some injectables in the lip area, I will take it. Mm -hmm. And I'll turn it over to Sari right now, who's just drawing up the magic stuff. Hi, everybody. So you could see we use really tiny needles for Botox. It doesn't really hurt. Uh, Zen can cue in more on that, but um, it's a quick procedure. Even with fillers, it's a quick procedure. Uh, there can be some downtime of bruising and swelling, but it's non-invasive and it does help with any asymmetries or even just a little bit of enhancement. So we don't like to change our patients here at Velour. We just like to enhance them so they feel more themselves and more refreshed and more well slept. And that's it. And the injectable industry is not limited to just aesthetics. It has to do a lot with mental health because, of course, People need injectables for all kinds of reasons, and it's not necessarily just wanting bigger lips or a more youthful look. There's a lot of medical necessities behind it, and so here goes. All right, and there you have it. We have finished our procedure. My lips have been injected in a way where it's subtle yet natural just to even out my asymmetry, and the Botox has been dropped in my nasal labial fold to help my smile be more even and help me talk at ease and thank you so much Sari. You, you are, are so welcome. incredible. She's got magic hands. I'm right <laughs> here at Velour Medical in New York City. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. If you've missed out dining in New York City for the past year, it's time to visit the legendary Vichy Cucina. Located in the heart of Midtown, Vichy specializes in blending delicious northern Italian and American cuisine with dishes such as the incredible Taglioni lobster, ravioli masala, asobuco, and paparadelli al telefono, along with many other mouthwatering offerings. You deserve a great night out. Call Vichy Cucina, 212-757-2600 or online at vichycucina.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Now coming up, we have our very famous culinary and wine segment. And this week, we are featuring Peter Guimatis, who's managing partner at Biche Cucina Restaurant Group and a celebrity himself. And we are chatting all things tequila. I'm going to be transporting you to Biche Cucina in Midtown, where Peter will be mixing a signature spring cocktail that is all natural, low sugar, low carbon carbs, and high effect. He's going to use fresh ingredients, top shelf alcohol, and if you're trying to lose weight, we're going to decrease the number of calories in this beverage and make it an awesome cocktail that won't affect your waistline. But first, let's talk tequila. Now, many alcoholic beverages are loaded with calories and added sugar, both of which may contribute to weight gain and essentially other health problems in the long term. For too long, tequila has had a bad rep. However, its renaissance in the last decade gaining popularity as a mood upper and low-cal spirit is slowly convincing consumers that's nothing but a misinformed stereotype. By now, if you still associate tequila with cringy shots responsible for your next day's hangover, you're likely drinking the wrong kind of tequila. That's right. Not all tequilas are created equal. Some might be hiding additives or even high fructose corn syrup that you might not want to be drinking. What exactly is tequila anyways? Well, let's start with the basics. In order for a spirit to be classified as tequila, it needs to be produced from 100% Blue Weber agave, which is typically grown in Mexican states. Now, these states comprise tequila's denomination of origin, otherwise known as DOM. Yep, it's an official abbreviation, which defines a product as being exclusive to a particular geographical area as regulated by Mexican law. Now, for anyone who's ever been to Mexico and driven past fields of agave, you'll recognize that agave isn't only grown in these five states. When agave spirits are produced in states outside the DOM, they can't be labeled tequila. So mezcal or bacanora, which are made of agave as well, become the equivalent of what sparkling wine is to champagne. All tequila is an agave spirit, but not all agave spirits are tequila. Does that make sense? 
Now, agavin, which is the natural sugar found in the sap of the raw agave plant, is believed to behave like a dietary fiber, which means it's not absorbed in the same way as other carb-derived substances, which may improve glycemic control and boost feelings of fullness. Preliminary studies suggest raw agave sap also contains modest amounts of prebiotics, saponins, which may alleviate inflammation, antioxidants, which support immunity, and plant-based iron, an essential mineral for individuals following plant-based diets. Tequila has about 97 calories per shot and no carbohydrates, according to the United States Department of Agriculture, as do other spirits such as vodka, rum, and whiskey. This gives it an edge over wine, beer, and hard ciders, which contain more calories, carbohydrates, and sugars per serving. Spiked seltzers have about the same number of calories as tequila per serving, but contain a few grams of carbs and sugar. Tequila is also gluten-free, as are many distilled spirits. Yes, even those that are distilled from grains. And since it's a clear spirit, tequila is generally lower in congeners, chemicals that result from the fermentation process. It's worth noting that when it comes to cocktails, the mixers are where extra calories and sugar can sneak in. So if you're looking to keep your drink super healthy, opt for something such as sparkling water or a squeeze of fresh juice, which are generally low in calories, sugar, and carbs. Now let's head down to Beach Cucina and catch Peter in action as he prepares our low calorie tequila cocktail. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. If you've missed out dining in New York City for the past year, it's time to visit the legendary Viche Cucina. Located in the heart of Midtown, Viche specializes in blending delicious northern Italian and American cuisine with dishes such as the incredible Taglioni lobster, ravioli masala, asobuco, and paparadelli al telefono, along with many other mouthwatering offerings. You deserve a great night out. Call Viche Cucina, 212-757-2600 or online at vichecucina.com. Welcome back, Zen, and I'm going to make you uh, a nice little uh, springy drink. Spring is just around the corner. I hope so anyway. And uh, we're going to keep it very all-natural, low sugar, all right, because everybody wants to get in shape for the springtime. So I'm going to start off with my favorite, which is a little bit of fresh basil. We're going to do some uh, strawberries. We're going to add some fresh mint leaves okay we're gonna just splash it off with a little bit of 100% uh, agave tequila just a little for now because I'm gonna use it to muddle well oh, there you go you just want to muddle all the fresh juices out of the strawberries the mint the basil You hear, the, you hear the tingling of the glass, you know you're almost ready for a nice crisp drink. I like to give it a little splash of some lemon. All right, now we add All right. serious tequila. Peter's adding the real flavor. Six ounces. Zen usually likes eight ounces. But we're only giving her six today. Ice for our mixing glass. All nice and mixed together. Little rocks glass. And there we have a great pour, and I can't wait to give this really cool drink a taste. Okay, so no one has ever tried a drink, especially on air or on the radio, and said, I hate it. So to be clear, I don't hate it. It's amazing, and I can't wait to drink some more of it. And that's exactly why you guys should come down to Vichy Cucina right here in Midtown Manhattan and check out the drinks being made live in action by Peter Grimatis, the owner. Peter, thank you so much. This was awesome. This is one way to make sure that we kick off our hot season coming right up. And of course, getting bikini ready starts with making sure that you're not overdoing it. We'll be right back after this. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WR, the voice of New York, live from Beachy Cucina, Midtown. A moment of Zen is brought to you by Tempest. 
That's the end of our date, my dear friends. Remember to join me right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, every Saturday night from 9 to 10 p.m. Or go to 710wor.iheart.com forward slash a moment of zen. And remember, we are now on TV. Download the KP Media TV app on Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, or Android TV. Or tune in at watch.kpmedia.tv and catch a moment of zen on the Impact Live channel Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern. All episodes are now available on demand. Thank you for listening to A Moment of Zen. It's been an absolute pleasure being your host. And of course, thanks again to all of our sponsors. Remember, happiness is the only thing that multiplies when you share it.